us here uh, today. God, we're grateful for your love and your mercy with us. Uh, God, we're so thankful for just uh, Merlene sharing her life. Yes. Uh, thank you, God, for how the, the cross has impacted her. And yeah. I, I pray, Lord, that we can remember how the cross impacted us. Yeah. Uh, God, thank you for all of our friends and visiting us today. Maybe it's the first time. I pray they feel welcome yeah. and loved, God, and uh, that they'll want to join our family. And Father, I'm so grateful again just for how you're working to spread our church all throughout New England. I pray that you uh, just prepare the mission teams. Uh, help us with our missions fundraiser right now. Yeah. Uh, God, that we can see that goal to completion. Uh, Father, we just pray you get the sermon today. God, be with my voice. And, and Father, I'm grateful for all that you've done. And Father, I pray you speak to us by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Come on. Hebrews chapter 11. And we have here the uh, Hall of Faith, what some people are called. And it lists all the great heroes of the faith in the Bible. Amen. And it's an incredible chapter that is just so inspiring. And he kind of concludes here in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gave what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength. Tell them a lesson is from weakness to strength. Amen. Yeah. And I love this because he lists a bunch of the judges. He talks about the prophets. And one of the powerful things about God's word is that our weaknesses can become our strengths. Amen. Amen. Now I just want you for a moment to write down what your weaknesses are. What's that one besetting sin you just not really overcome? Maybe it's a character issue, and you just need more discipline, and you're always late to things, or you're always behind in life and your bills or whatever. Maybe that's the weakness, right? What is the weakness in your life that you go, God, I want to turn this to strength? And today, the sermon's going to be a blessing to you because we're going to look at the scriptures on how we transform our weaknesses to our strengths like these great men of God did. Amen? Amen. Now, I want to make clear what weakness is and what it means to be weak in the Bible. Of course, we all have different aspects in our character and in our spiritual lives where we're weak and we need strengthening. Amen? And so I think of weakness as maybe going to the gym, right? When you can't lift a certain amount of weight, it's because you're weak and those muscles need built more, right? Yeah. From a biblical perspective, being weak means you keep trying, but you keep failing. In fact, you can actually be a fully committed Christian and still weak. Did you know that? Yeah. And sometimes when we get sick, or maybe someone has a mental illness, right? Or some type of disability, that it makes them weak physically even, right? But even God wants to work even in that to show his glory. And I love this. It was totally the Holy Spirit that Josh shared the scripture. So I was going to share this in my sermon in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Come on, Mike. And in verse 26. Go away. So brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Amen. Not many of you are wise by human standards. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Not many of you were influential. Amen. Not many were of noble birth. Okay, Paul, we get the point. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It's because of him that you're in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Amen. You know, the Bible says that God shows the weak things, and God loves to do what I call the Gideon. Amen. And the Gideon is where he takes someone who's weak, lowly, got challenges in their life, and if you're honest and humble, we all have those. Amen. Amen. And what he does with the Gideon is he transforms those weaknesses into strengths. See, God, when it comes to spiritual weaknesses, does not intend to, for you to stay in that place. Yeah. In fact, he wants to show his power. And even when the odds seem the most against you, those are the kind of odds God loves. Yeah. He loves when there's a Goliath. He loves when there's walls surrounding a city. He loves when there's thousands of men because God can take inanimate objects like a donkey's jawbone and do the incredible in the Bible. Samson, amen? Yeah. And these are the men that are listed in the Hall of Faith. You see, when 
when we get to a place in our weaknesses where we only can overcome if we have God's power, that's what God wants us. And so it's a lot of times starting by not getting bitter at our weaknesses. But understanding that God has allowed them in our lives or brought them in our lives so that we'll learn to rely on his power. Now, do you want to find out how to do that? Yes. Yes. Amen. Well, let's go to Judges chapter 6, and we're going to study Gideon today. Amen. Come on, Gideon. Come on, Come on Mike. Come on, Mike. Judges Mike. chapter 6. Come on. And you are free to shout amen. 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 It's okay to be zealous at church and fired up. Uh, we got a new Kids Kingdom rotation going on right now, so we've got some new teachers, and we definitely want to thank the teachers who did serve our kids that are back here in service with us. Some people are still in there shadowing today, and so we, we have some people that are not serving today uh, training the new Kids Kingdom teachers. Uh, but man, what an incredible sacrifice to be with our kids in uh, this worship service for about three months, amen? So please be sure to thank them. In Judges chapter 6, in verse 1, the Bible says, The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. For seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites, because the power of Midian was so oppressive. The Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts and caves and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped in the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza, and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock. And their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them. And more their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian was so impoverished that the Israelites, they cried out to the Lord for help. Well, here we find God's people in a very weak state here. And their weakness was brought on by their sin in this instance. And we find that any time there's sin, what happens? Fear comes. Sin causes insecurity, yeah. fear, and now that all God's people are running to hide in caves and clefts so that because they're being oppressed now by their enemies. See, when we give in to sin, the enemy, Satan, comes into our life, does he not? Yeah. And the Bible, we've got to remember, the Old Testament are physical realities that foreshadow spiritual truths. Yeah. And so what happened here is that God's people are hiding and they're scared and they're fearful because they've sinned and God gave them over to their enemies, the Midianites. And the Midianites keep on coming. Every time they plant their crops, their crops grow and the Midianites come and they steal their crops and take them from them. And understand that when you're in sin, spiritually speaking, and you're hiding out in a cave, spiritually speaking, mm -hmm. any seed you plant of evangelism, what's the enemy come and do? He takes it. Are you with me right here? Yeah. And so that crop doesn't grow. The fruit of the Spirit that the Holy Spirit gives doesn't grow. Love, peace, joy, kindness, forbearance. Are you with me right here? All these fruits of the Spirit. So I want to encourage you, a lot of times when God is bringing hardship in our lives or allowing it to happen, we first need to look and go, is there sin in my life that's causing this weakness? Yeah. Now, not all the time that weakness occurs just because of sin. Right. But understand in this particular case, in this particular case, excuse me, that they were hiding out because of their sin. And God was bringing hardship so that they would eventually cry out to him. And that's what they did. You know, in hardship, we need to cry out to God. Yes. Not get bitter at God. Cry out to God for his help. Verse 7. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian. He sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. You know, when you cry out to God, he sends a man of God into your life, does he not? Oh, I know we hear that testimony after testimony. I appreciate it. We're like, just like, I'm going to Hillsong. This is in the church. And I'm, you know, living this ungodly life. And I'm trying. And I'm praying. And God sends a disciple into their life. Amen. Amen. So you cry out to God. Sometimes you cry out to God. But God, help me. I want to find the truth. And a brother studying the Bible with you. And you're like, yeah, I just need time right now. Because i got to figure this out with me and God. God, help me! Well, I'm trying to study the Bible. I know. If I didn't figure this out on my own, God, help me! It is rare when someone ever came to God in the Bible without another human being coming over their life. I would challenge you to look for it. Are you with me right here? Yes. Come on, the Apostle Paul, Jesus appeared to him and stuff. Well, no, read it again. Right. He sent Ananias to go to yes. the I want to challenge you, if you're studying the Bible right now with some of the Christians in the church, 
God has sent these people into your life to help deliver you from the enemies. And you need to receive it with joy. Are you with me right here? And the prophet comes in verse 7. He says, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. And I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord, your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land that you live. But you've not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the open bow run that belonged to Joash the Abbasite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. So here we meet Gideon, amen? And he's so fearful that he's threshing wheat under a wine press, just in fear of the Midianites. And verse 12, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. You know, one of the first keys to turning our weaknesses to strength, and is our first point, is you have to see yourself the way God sees you. Amen. You have to see yourself the way God sees you. I mean, there's nothing good about the situation going on right here. Yeah. And there's nothing good about the circumstances. And oftentimes we go, well, God hates me. He's against me. Why is this the short end of the stick I always get in my life? Come on, Mike. And this is how Gideon is feeling, weak, insecure, and fearful. God looks down, and he doesn't see a weak, fearful, insecure man. He goes, God is with you, mighty warrior. That shows me that God sees us not as we are, but for the potential that we have. Amen. You know, I love it, you know, because God, he always says throughout the New Testament that we are saints, that we have been redeemed, that we are his children, and that is your primary identity, amen? Yes. But oftentimes we identify with our weaknesses and with yes. our sins, yes. and then we wonder why we associate with garbage sin, it's because we feel like garbage, are you with me right here? But when you believe the way God sees you as a mighty warrior, things begin to change, amen? Yes. I love Joel 3, verse 10. He says, God says, let the weakling say, I am strong. Yeah. And I love that verse because what God's saying in Joel 3 10 is like, man, yeah, amen, you might be weak right now, but that's not who I made you to be. Yeah. I am strong is what you got to say, man. Yeah. You know, right, right now, I want you to say, I'm God three, I am strong. One, two, three. I am strong. So you can say it. I don't know what's going God saved you and gave you his spirit inside of you. And so you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And in John, it's amazing because he says here, I love them the same way I love Jesus. Wow. Like God loves you the exact same way he loved his son Christ. Wow. We're going to read about that in John 17. I mean, it's pretty powerful to think about that the Father loves us that much. And you go, no, Mike, you don't understand. You don't understand the things I've done that I've not talked to anyone about you. You don't understand how I fell short this weekend. Well, I do understand because the Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have fallen short. Amen. So welcome to the club. Amen. But you know, I want to really encourage you to go, amen. I got to remember who I am. I'm a prince of God. I'm a princess of God. I'm royalty. And so that means that I simply need to walk in the light. Be open with my sin and reclaim who I am, that you're a mighty warrior for the Lord. Yeah. You know, what do you identify as this morning? An employee, a husband, an athlete, an LGBTQ, whatever person? I mean, at the end of the day, guys, these are the things people identify with. Yeah. <laughs> and and they, take, they take pride in that identity. And the reality is, is that any time that there's a conflict that we're feeling spiritually, it's because we identify something with something else. Why does someone miss church for work on a midweek or a Wednesday night? Well, their identity is they're an employee first. Wow. Not a Christian. Why does someone put their family before God and a spiritual family? Well, it's because their primary identity first is a husband, first is a wife, first is a brother, first is a sister. When their primary identity should be a son of God. Come on. Why does someone idolize and worship football? 
football, our basketball, our sports, it's because their number one identity is an athlete before yeah. God. Wow. Yeah. And so when you understand that you're a son of God, you're a mighty warrior for the Lord, you're going to put the Lord first, amen? Yeah. And God's trying to get this through Gideon's head. You know, I, I love this story uh, called You Are an Eagle. And it says, while walking through the forest one day, a man found a young eagle who had fallen out of his nest. He took it home and put it in his barnyard where it learned to eat and behave like the chickens. One day, a naturalist passed by the farm and asked, why is it that the king of all birds should be confined to live in the barnyard with chickens? The farmer replied that since he had given the chicken feed and trained it to be a chicken, they had never learned to fly. Since it now behaved as the chickens, it was no longer an eagle. Wow. Still, it has the heart of an eagle, replied the naturalist, and can surely be taught to fly. He lifted the eagle toward the sky and said, You belong in the sky, not the earth. Stretch forth your wings and fly. The eagle, however, was confused. He did not know who he was, and seeing the chickens eating their food, he jumped down to be with them again. The naturalist took the bird to the roof of the house and urged him again, saying, You are an eagle. Stretch forth your wings and fly. But the eagle was afraid of his unknown self and whirled and jumped down once more for the chicken food. Finally, the naturalist took the eagle out of the barnyard to a high mountain. There he held the king of birds high above him and encouraged him again, saying, You are an eagle. You belong to the sky. Stretch forth your wings and fly. The eagle looked around, back towards the barnyard, and up to the sky. Then the naturalist lifted him straight towards the sun, and it happened that the eagle began to tremble. Slowly he stretched his wings, and with a triumphant cry, soared away into the heavens. It may be that the eagle still remembers, with nostalgia, the time of the chickens. It may be that he even occasionally revisits the barnyard. But as far as anyone knows, he has never returned to lead the life of a chicken. And I love this because at the end of the day, this eagle needed to continually be told and reminded and put in a place where he could remember his identity. Amen. Wow. And our high mountain is the kingdom of God. Yeah. Our high mountain is God's church. In fact, it was prophesied as a mountain that would fill the earth. Yeah. And oftentimes we forget our identity because we stop coming to church. Wow. And then we can't remember who we are and we wonder why we're weak spiritually. And part of the key yeah. to getting wow. strong and turning weakness to strength is church attendance. Wow. And I'm not talking about Praise only life. on Sundays. I'm talking about daily relationships yeah. Yeah. where two or more gather together. Right. 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 So we can remember who we are. And God's trying to get Gideon to remember you're a mighty warrior. Yeah. I'm with you, amen. amen. What's your primary identity today? How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as God's child? Once you do, you'll begin to soar for the Lord, amen. 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 Yeah. Point number two, one of the challenges that we need to understand is if you decide to follow God, get ready for God-sized battles. Yeah. 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 Our battles, sometimes we look at people in the world and we go, man, they have it so easy. Well, yeah. <laughs> Satan's got them already. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And you know how it is. You're on the street and you're like looking at someone driving in a nice car or you're looking at their nice home and you're like, I wish that could be me. <laughs> but I've got to give a special issues. Talk about it, in our hearts. Oh, yeah. wow. yeah. I could go to that concert tonight, but I've got Friday night campus, oh, yeah. Tebow. Yeah. Come on. I follow God. 
get ready for some God-sized battles. Well, Gideon was getting ready. Let's read on. Let's see what happens. This is exciting. Chapter 6, yes, verse 13. It says, pardon me, my lord, Gideon replied. So remember, this right after he told me he's a mighty warrior. Uh, pardon me, my lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all those wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. You ever felt like that? I mean, this is an inspiring sermon, Mike, and that's a nice thought, but how come my life has sucked? How come everything's gone bad? Yeah. How come everything has tanked that I've done? Yeah. Come on, Mike. Well, he says in verse 14, the Lord turned him and said, go in the strength you have and yes. save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Yeah. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down the Midianites leading out of the line. God intended for Gideon to go on this mission to go and save God's people from the hand of Midian. And if you're a Christian, you've been sent on a mission yeah. to go and save people from the hand of Satan. Yeah. We've been sent on a mission that in some ways is a God-sized battle. Because it's overwhelming. It's us versus the world. Wow. And we'll learn from chapter 8 that their army was 185,000 Midianites that he would be going up against. And so he's telling Gideon, I'm going to send you. And Gideon's struggling here. He's still wrestling in his heart. And he says, go in the strength that you have. Muster up what you have. And I will work. I will be with you. Yeah. I want to encourage you, if you're here this morning, it's because you have strength. Okay. If you're watching online and you felt too weak to come to church today, wow. it's because you have a little bit of strength and you turned on that. Wow. And God says, hey, listen, it's okay. I'm still going to work with you because you're yeah. my work. I just need you to reach down and use the strength you have yeah. and go. Wow. And oftentimes it's just taking action where God comes in and starts to strengthen and yeah. work. Keep your finger there. Go to 2 Chronicles 16. Come on, buddy. Come on, In 2 Chronicles chapter 16. I, I thought it was interesting that Gideon said in uh, verse 15 of, of Judges that he was from the weakest clan. Yeah. It certainly was. This clan did not have a good history if you read about it in the Bible. And he goes, I'm the weakest in my, in my clan, my family. How, how, why would you use me? Wow. I appreciated Marlene sharing today. Yes. Come on, Marlene. She goes, man, I, I, I came from a weak situation. I, I didn't, you know, but my dad forced himself on my mom. And that, that's how I was born. And, yeah. and, and, and then I didn't even, he wasn't part of my life. And she could go, man, you don't understand my life and where I come from and just kind of accept the beat of life. Yeah. But she goes, you know something? Now she can share about these yeah. weaknesses. Yeah. Uh, and boast about them. We'll talk more about that later. Come on. Yeah. But she can bring these out into the light, and now she's going on a mission team to serve God. I'm getting to has a good end of the story, so you see. Did she get the game? You know, this passage in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, it says, oh, let me check here. There we go. Verse 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. You know, I love this verse because it says that God's eyes are ranging through the earth, right? They're just looking, looking, looking. I'm looking at every single person's picture. Oh. <laughs> looking. <laughs> And then he sees someone who's fully committed and goes, wow. strengthens them. Wow. Yeah. That's what he does. Yeah. Now, he doesn't strengthen them first, and then they become fully committed. Yeah. Oh, That's where we get jacked up. Yeah. Well, God, give me strength, give me strength. Well, get fully committed. Yeah, there we go. You have to decide to be committed. What's it mean to be committed? You realize being committed is something you can do in a weak state. I can be the weakest physical specimen on the face of the planet. Yeah. 
And I can still be committed to going to the gym. Wow, yeah. Wow. Being committed doesn't have anything to do with how strong you are. Yeah, right? Right. Well, well Christian, oh, I'm just weak, so I'm not going to go to church. No, you're uncommitted. Ooh. You got to show up. Amen. You got to show up to the practice, amen? You got to show up to the gym, amen? Come on, a little quiet. I, I, yeah, come on. I don't know the I did. And, and God's looking and goes, man, I want to strengthen that person because their deeds are showing their faith. Come on. And so the key to being fully committed, or the key to being strengthened, excuse me, is deciding to be fully committed. Come on, bro. Um, it's interesting because if you go back to Judges chapter 6, we're not going to read all of it for time. But what happens next is Gideon, of course, um, if you look in verse 16, we left here. It says, the Lord answered, I'll be with you and we'll strike down the Midianites leaving not alive. I mean, I'd be pretty fired up if God just told me that. And yet, in verse 17, Gideon replied, If I've now found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it's really you talking to me. You ever been there? Yeah. Some of you are studying the Bible and you're going, Is this really the church of God? Is this really God? Right? And so we can doubt. The thing I really appreciate about God in this particular case is he's very patient with you. Yeah. And he's willing to work with him. And it's kind of cool. In verse 18, he says, Please do not go away until I come back and bring an offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I'll wait until you return. <laughs> God's, God's just going to wait on Gideon. Right. You know, we're always told to wait on the Lord. Here, God's going to wait on Gideon. Is that pretty encouraging? Yeah. yeah. And so he goes, gets sacrificed, and boom, you know, and, and the magic happens or whatever. And, and he goes, oh my gosh, I've seen God face to face. I might die. <laughs> And God's like, no, it's okay. You're not going to die. And then Gideon goes, talks to God. They make some more sacrifices. And God goes, okay, here's the deal. You know, I want you to go and save God's people out of the Midianites. But you need to go back to your home. And you need to destroy the idols there. Right. And they had some gross idols that caused people to be in their morality. Uh, Baals and astropoles. And so Gideon goes, okay, I'll do it. He does it at night so his family doesn't see it. I'm going to get in, you know. And, and sometimes, you know how it is. You're studying the Bible with someone, you're like, bro, you need to go do this, and you need to forgive, you need to forgive your mom, you know, for hurting you. And, and then you just leave like a note at night or something like that. <laughs> you know, you know, I don't actually face it, you know what I'm talking about? But the guy, you did it, you forgave it. Amen! So sometimes God is patient with us. And so Gideon goes and destroys all the idols, and then in the morning they're ticked off. They go, the family's like, whoever did this needs to die. <laughs> You know, one of Gideon's relatives is like, Amen. Well, this is the Mike Patterson paraphrase. Right now. Uh, one of Gideon's rel relatives is like, Amen. Can't Baal contend for himself if he's really a god? <laughs> so, Amen. It is what it is. And Gideon gets more faith. But it's not there yet, totally. Mm -hmm. And then Gideon goes, Okay, God, I know you're sending me on this mission, but if it's really going to work, it's really going to be victorious, I'm going to set out a fleece at night. And when I wake up in the morning, if there's dew on it, I know it's you talking to me. God does that. There's dew on it in the morning. He goes, okay, pardon me, Lord. I'm going to do it one more time in case it was a mistake or the weather was just like it that day. I'm going to put the fleece out. And this time, if it's dry, there's no dew and the dew's on the ground, then I'll know it's you with me. And of course, God is faithful. And God does it, amen. And a lot of times when we have these God-sized battles we need to face, we like to delay, don't we? Yeah. We like to take our time, and we like to sound spiritual. But God's already told us the answer. Wouldn't it have been great if he would have just been like, God, you already told me I could take this and just went for it? Wow. But oftentimes we do that. If you're studying the Bible, a lot of times you go, well, I just need a sign on whether I should get baptized or not. Well, I want to challenge you. If you need a sign on whether you should be adulterous or not, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I really think about cheating on my wife. God, can I lay out a fleece here and if I'm supposed to? Or not? That's not what Gideon is. And a lot of people misuse this passage. God, I'm going to put a fleece out there to see if I'm supposed to date this girl or not. Or whatever. And it's like, no. God already told them what they're supposed to do. They're going to go save Israel. You just need to take action. Now, God will allow you to put fleeces out to strengthen your faith for what you're supposed to do. Wow. But not on my so should I get baptized or not? Well, dude, Christ commands you to. Guys, delay in obedience is disobedience to God. Just like we wouldn't want our children to disobey us. 
like that and take their time, right? You know how it is when you have a kid. When I talk to my daughter, I ask her to do something. I'm like, tell me now. <laughs> Not, you know, she's like running around the house before she does it or whatever. And you're like, no, now. <laughs> and then she'll, she'll get it, amen? But we're like that a lot of times with God. Well, let's look at what happens. Judges chapter 7 here. His faith's been built. Well, Mike. We read in verse 40 that that night God did it. Only the fleece was dry. All the ground was covered in two. Well, chapter 6, verse 40. Is even. And then in chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Early in the morning, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all his men camped in the spring power. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moriah. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel will boast against me. My own strength is safe. Now announce to the army, Anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left. Well, 10,000 remained. Now remember, they're going up against how many? Do you want to remember? 185,000. So God goes, whoa, 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 Gideon. You've got too many men here, and I don't want you to go around saying, yeah, look at what we did. All those who are cowards and scared, tell them to leave. And so I imagine Gideon going, okay, <laughs> hey guys, if you're afraid and you don't really want to do this, you can go. And all of a sudden people start, stop, start dropping their, their weapons there and shields and stuff, and they're just all leaving. And Gideon's standing there going, oh God, <laughs> oh God, what have I gotten myself into? Yeah. You know, we need to understand, church, that God is never concerned about the quantity, right. but the quality. Mm -hmm. And if you're not going to be a sold-out disciple, you can leave. Yeah. You can leave. God is concerned about the heart. Yeah. <laughs> Being fully committed to Him. Oh amen. You know, look at what He says here. We go, okay, man. We're, we got our 10,000. Amen. Verse 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, There are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. If I say to this one, he shall go, he shall go. But if I say to this one, shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog from those who lap with their kneel, uh, kneeling down to drink. Three hundred of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs, and all the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the three hundred men that lapped, I will save you. And give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Oh my goodness. Wow. Well, now they're down to 300. This is a God sized battle. Yeah. And the significance of the cupped hands, because those who drink the water kneeling down with the cupped hands can stay because they're the ones that are going to be alert. For war, they yeah. can hold their shield and drink at the same time. Are you with me right here? And so he goes with these three hundred. I'm going to save Israel. Amen. Come on. I believe that with this church, yes. God will save you. Amen. 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 But we got to go from weakness to strength. And this is what God is helping get. Now God's got getting into the place where he's willing to go to the war. Are you with me right yeah. here? Yeah. And they're down to 300. This is a high pressure situation. You know, maybe you've been overwhelmed. What have you been overwhelmed about? Come on. Why don't you write down what you've been overwhelmed about? Some said school. Maybe exams. Financial pressures. Health. Health. Challenges. What is it that just overwhelms you? It's brought you anxiety this week. Um, these are God-sized battles. And God oftentimes allows these things in our lives so that he can display his glory and a miracle. What are some different God-sized battles? Well, we listed some uh, ones that we deal with in life. A death in the family can yeah. be one. Yeah. Heartbreak can be one. Yeah. We laugh about it, but the reality is if you find out someone doesn't like you or that you really were pursuing, it, it, it can be heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. And it can seem like a God-sized battle. Oh, my um, but there are things in the church that honestly can overwhelm us. Yeah. If we're real. 
I've been there. I, you know, I'm a minister, and I, I struggle. Sometimes I can be overwhelmed. Yeah. And there's been days it's just hard to get out of bed and just go to church. Come on, come on. Because of so much emotional pressure and things that need to get done in this sort of thing, right? That happens to all of us, but it's really how we deal with it that matters. Yeah. So remember, feeling feelings of fear is not a sin. Feeling fear, feelings of stress is not a sin, but it's giving into these that's a sin that God doesn't want us to do. He wants us to come to Him. So there are some God-sized battles. I think just becoming a Christian is a God-sized battle. Oh my yeah. I mean, man, it, 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 this is often times why people who study the Bible with wrestle and they struggle because they realize their entire life is being turned around. Yeah, their schedule's being turned around. <laughs> the date and Mary's being turned around. I mean, uh, the people they used to spend time with is turning around. I mean, that's a lot of life change. Yeah, come on. And it can seem like a God-sized battle. You know, secondly, I think relationship issues in the church can yeah. be a God-sized battle. Mm, yeah. um, it's been interesting. It's been a couple of weeks. I've had a few people talk to me this past week about just challenges they were having with different people in the church. And in some cases, it actually made them want to leave the church. Wow. And, and, and that can happen. We get so hurt in our faith because our faith starts to look more at people mm, instead yeah. of God. Amen. Yeah. And so man, I'm not just talking to a few people. This is this has happened to a lot. But I realize this is a baby church. Yeah. And I don't mean that in any kind of bad way. I was talking with some of the leaders about it. Like most of the church is under two years spiritually. Yeah. Like almost all the church. And that's crazy to think about. That means we're still growing in our faith. Yeah. Yeah. And I was wrestling with, you know, some of the ICCM students being kind of up and down with ICCM. And, and I was telling them, you know, the class the other day, I've never had a class like that. Where it's yeah. just kind of, I'm going to drop out, I'm going to quit, I'm going to join, I'm going to quit. I'm gonna, you know, I'm like, what in the world is going on? Yeah. Come on and then I was wrestling with, you know, some of the mission, there's a few mission team members. I'm not going to be on the mission team. I'm not going to be on the mission team. I'm going to be on the mission team. I'm not going to be on the mission team. You know? And, and again, I'm not picking on one person. Yeah. I'm just saying I hit me the other day as I talked to some of the leaders that, you know what, it's just because we're new in the faith. Yeah. yeah. And that kind of put my heart at, at peace. I go, yeah. you know something? We, we, we just need to grow spiritually. Yeah. Oh my God. We just need to mature a little bit. Like Amen. God's asking us to do a lot of intense things yeah. that honestly, most churches in our movement, most mission teams always have mature Christians on. I've been around right. for years. Yeah. And so what do we do? We just quit and give up? No, no we got to turn our weaknesses to strength. But how do you deal with relationships? you got to go to Jesus. What's Jesus say? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 18. All right. Come on, Mike. Come on, Mike. Come on, bro. Matthew 18. This is one of those ones I always come back and preach every once in a while. I mean, so, so. Don't, don't turn off and leave. You're like, oh, there you go. <laughs> I've always heard in the Bible the scriptures that talk about Timothy. Keep reminding them of these things. Yeah, yeah. So a preacher's job is to repeat himself over and over again until things change. Exactly. And uh, Matthew 18 and verse 15, Jesus gives us the way on how to deal with uh, interpersonal relationships in the congregation. Because oftentimes I found that I can feel things against somebody, even if it happens to me. And when I talk to them about it, I realize I wrote an entire story about what they were thinking in my head. Yeah, real. I'm like, struggling. Every day that goes by just gets more intense, the more evil, and then, you know. And it's just crazy because I better realize, number one, most Christians actually want to please God. Yeah. And I think that we can understand that in the church, that there's no one that's really out to get you, right? right. Like, 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 we got to trust at some level. Love always trusts, First Corinthians 13, right? Yeah. But here we find in Matthew 18, verse 15, he says, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. Now, I like in the older NIV, it says, If your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you won them over. Amen? So if someone sins against us in the church, you go and tell their disciples. No. You go and tell Mike and Chanel. No. You go and tell, you know, Mayfair. No. You know, um, no, you go and talk to the person. Now, for time, I'm not going to get into it. I think you can make a scriptural case. There are some situations where the person doesn't feel safe talking to the person. Yeah. And then in that case, you can go to a shepherd or an evangelist, and then we can uh, deal with it. 
Amen? Amen. Because there might be a situation that was hurt or dangerous or emotionally manipulative or abusive or things like that. Then, then you want to go to someone that can help you. Amen? Yeah. But here Jesus teaches that you go directly to the person in the general sense. And, and in most cases, I find disciples get resolved and they're crying and they love each other. <laughs> and all yeah. 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 In rare cases... It goes to verse 16, but if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So, you know, uh, Dylan over here, you know, hurt my feelings, right? Hello, Dylan. What do you do? I do it. I pulled Dylan aside and I tried to talk to him, and Dylan goes, you know, shut up, Mike. Oh, my God. Conversation goes nowhere. You ever had a conversation that you yeah. nowhere? Yeah. You ever talk to somebody that's yes. worse and you're more mad than leaving? Yeah. Well, this verse is for that situation, amen? You go, all right, I got to get two or three others who are spirit filled in the church because Galatians 6 1 says that they must be spiritual. So you want to get someone who's maybe overdoing the Lord, spiritually speaking, that can come in and mediate the situation. And oftentimes that's just what it takes because someone more spiritual can see the sin in the situation and disciples yes. and bring unity in God's church. Amen. Yes. Very rarely have I seen this done. We, we've done this a few times in our congregation. But it says in verse 17, if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. So that, that's step three of church discipline. And go, hey, this person we met with, they're still not changing. And we've got to bring them before the church, not on a witch hunt, but so that we can pray for them and love them. And oftentimes it's church discipline that saves some of us. Some of us are still here because of church discipline. And we made it, you know, we went to this place. We were too stubborn to leave, you know. But we, we got in front of the church and we knew we needed to repent. You know, the final stage is the, the most heartbreaking one. But it says that they still refuse to listen to the church. In verse 17, and if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan and a tax collector. And that's when someone is asked to leave or for disfellowship because now uh, they're a poison to the body of Christ. Yeah. Um, amputation is always the last resort. Right. The goal is that we can rehabilitate. Yeah. Yeah. And so I want you to think about are there any situations in the church that you just need to go to the person and deal with? Come on, Mike. You're going to get weaker and weaker every day spiritually until you deal with your relationship issues. Yeah. If there's any unforgiveness, it's got to come out of the heart. Amen. Come on. Come on. Another God-sized battle can be special missions contribution. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. And that will either make you spiritually fired up or yeah. overwhelmed in the mind, right? Like, oh, wow. It, it, just, it just does. I, guys, I'm serious. I, I, I have people, well, why are we talking about money? Yeah. Because we're trying to like plant churches. Right. <laughs> like, how are you going to do that without money? Right. Yeah. But you know, the enemy comes into our minds sometimes and starts writing stories. Yeah. And we need to understand that special mission is defeated by a sold out heart. That 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 giant, if you will. Yeah. Look over here, Matthew thirteen. Come on, Come on. Right. This is awesome. In Matthew thirteen and verse forty four. Oh my God. I want to contrast two passages. So, in Matthew 13, verse 44, Jesus tells a parable, and he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he did it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found it of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Amen. Amen. God calls his church a treasure. Wow. He calls it a pearl. Is it not, guys? Yeah. Yes. 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 Like, I literally think about sometimes what I would do without the kingdom. Yeah. I mean, what do people do out there without the church? <laughs> like, gosh, what a, a horrible way to live. I mean, gosh, you need to move to a new location. You've got, you got to actually hire a movie company, right? Yeah, right. Or maybe you have like, two buddies or something. Come on, show us. Yeah. 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 I mean, isn't that awesome? Yeah. You know, you say, hey, I need some help, and then like 10, 20 people show yeah. up, right? Yeah. Like, done in a moment. You know, right? Like, yeah, I love the fact that when I was single, I could go out on dates. Yeah. And you yeah. just knew it was going to be a pure time. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about what's going to happen at the end or, you know, like hitch, jingling the keys or whatever. Oh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I should bring up Wilson. Oh, no. I love the fact that 
we can have different opinions and all be together and complete yeah, unity. Yeah. Yes. There's nothing like what's going on right now in this city all around us. And it's a treasure that this man found, and he goes, oh my gosh. Back then, if you found a treasure, you know, you might risk losing it if it was someone else's land, or, you know, yeah. someone could dispute it. He goes, I'm going to bury this, and I'm going to purchase the property so I know it's mine. Wow. And I'm going to sell everything I have to have it. And the Bible makes a point to say when the man found it, he hit it again, verse 44, and then in his joy, oh. sold all he had. You know, I love when you gave contribution today. It was in your joy. Yes. I won't start laughing again, man. Yes. <laughs> it was in your joy. That's what God intends for us. I've never met a sold out Christian that's given everything to God that's not, you know, that, that's struggling or bad. Right. You know, this is powerful. If you look in Mark chapter 10, let's contrast the scripture. Come on. Come on, bro. You guys with me here still? Yeah. Yeah. We have a few minutes here. Okay. In Mark chapter 10, in verse 17, we have the story of the rich man who comes to Jesus, and he asks him, what I must do to inherit eternal life? And, uh, Jesus goes, well, what are, the, what are the commands, you know, or he goes, yeah, I'm sorry, excuse me, he goes, you know the commandments, and Jesus lists a bunch of the commandments, and in verse 20, the guy says, I've kept all of these. So this is the guy that you go, on the first appearance, this guy sold out. Yeah. And then, let's look at what he says, in verse 30, 21, Jesus looked at him and said, loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away what? Sad. Sad, because he had great wealth. A guy that was 98% maybe committed. Wow. And Jesus goes, in love, the one thing that you lack, the one thing that's separating you from true joy, go sell your possessions because your possessions have a hold of you. Wow. And he walks away sad. Wow. Where the other guy in the parable sold everything yeah. in that joy. Wow. Are you joyful this morning? Come on. Yeah. 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 If, if you're not, and you're, and you're wrestling, I would encourage you, what's, what's that 2% yeah. that you're not giving up? What's that one thing you're holding on? Wow. See, when we give up everything, there's nothing to hold us on to this earth anymore. Yeah. Yeah. We're totally gods. Yeah. Um, I'm so fired up about Loxley getting baptized. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a, encouraging. Uh, here's another person from Maine. Yeah. Yeah. Willing to be sold out for God. Yeah. And, you know, I, I appreciate just the heart to go, I'm willing to go late nights, drive whatever distance it takes. Wow. To serve God. Come on. When there are members in our church that aren't willing to drive 15 minutes to come to church. Wow. Come on. Help us out. You go, well, why am I weak or why am I struggling? It's good. You've got to be fully committed. Come on. Yeah. So what's the story of Gideon really all about? Is it about Gideon getting strong? No. It's about saving Israel out of Gideon's hands. Wow. God had a war for him to fight. And we have a war. Is it about you just going for one just to strike? No. It's about winning the world to Christ. Yeah. See, it's not just about you feeling good. Right. There's a mission in a God-sized battle that we have. That's right. You know, I'm excited because we got oh, Easter coming up. And traditionally, people go to church the most on Easter. Yeah. Yeah. So for true disciples, that's a massive opportunity yeah. to get a bunch of friends and visitors yeah. out to church. Amen. Yeah. And so I've been thinking about, who am I going to bring out to Easter service? You know, finally, as we close, to win the war, point three, you must have a battle plan. Amen. Come on. Go back to Judges chapter seven. Come on. I'm going to summarize verses one through fourteen with the Mike Patterson paraphrase for you. <laughs> and uh, what happens is, is that in chapter seven, verse one, you notice it's early in the morning. So, hey, if you ever have an impact, you got to do early in the morning. Amen. Come on, man. So the Christian does. Um, it's kind of cool. What happens is uh, they go, and God, uh, of course, we saw in chapter 7, verse 1, early in the morning, he strips them down. And in chapter uh, 7, verse 15, or excuse me, verse uh, 8 and on, what happens is that uh, Gideon, God tells Gideon, go, the time is now, I'm going to save Israel. 
Gideon goes and sneaks into the camp of the Midianites. Now, they're staying in this valley with these kind of mountains surrounding them. That would be important to understand later. And they're, the Midianites are staying there. One of the Midianites has this dream. And Gideon overhears him talking. One of the guys wakes up on the side. He goes, you know, I have this kind of strange dream. And he doesn't say that part, does he? But, but he goes, I have this dream. And in the dream, I saw this barley loaf of bread appear in the sky and come down and land on the Midianites. And one of the other soldiers goes, that must be none other than the sword of the Lord for Gideon. Wow. Now, I always read that and it's kind of like, same, bro, same. How did you like draw yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that, that, that passage. I just, you know, you know those passages in the Bible just kind of read it and you go, "Hey man, did you move on?" Yeah, that's always one of those ones for me. Yeah. And but when you study it out, it's interesting because the barley loaf of bread was the one of bread that you ate that was like the weakest for the poorest people. Mm. It was the one that was the cheapest, mm. and it crumbled so easily. And God is giving us an inspiring vision. God wanted Gideon to hear this because he's going, I'm going to take those 300. Because Gideon, remember, he's going, I'm the weakest. I'm going to take that weak barley bread, 300 of God's people. And I am going to crush the enemies of God with the barley bread. (laughs) Church, we were the lowly that was called into the world. We were the barley bread that God's going to use crush atheistic New England. Yeah. And one of the soldiers goes, oh, probably did the end. Because they knew that those God's people were pathetic in their minds. Wow. Well, in chapter 7, verse 15, it says, when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into our hands. Dividing the 300 men into the three companies, he placed the trumpets and the empty jars in the hands of all of them, with the torches inside. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. You think he believed in imitation, guys? Verse 18, when I and all who are with me blow up our trumpets, then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout, for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the 100 men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. Just after they changed the guard, they blew their trumpets broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted the sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And while each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. The army fled to Bethsheba, towards Syria, as far as the border of Abel, Malad, towards a uh, near Tyre. Guys, they had victory. And if you read the whole thing, you read in chapter 8, verse 10, for example, they went up against 185,000 men, and they won! Yeah. Because God changed their weakness to strength. Amen. Amen. You know, I'm excited because there was a strategy when you like really look at this. And oftentimes in the Bible, there's always a strategy. God goes to Joshua, take the promised land, I'll be with you. But he's not just like, okay, let's just all run and charge him. Like, no, there's a strategy, there's an organization that's done. Yeah. You know, Jesus tells us, go and make disciples of all nations, right? Yes. But we're not just like, okay, what's that mean? We just kind of scatter and do whatever. Like, there's an organized plan. And here Gideon gets the 300 men, and he goes, all right. 100 of you guys take the leftover jars and torches of of one group. The other 100, you take all the leftover weapons and torches and jars of one group. And the other 100, take the other weapons. This 100, go on that side of the mountain. You go on this side of the mountain. You go on this side of the mountain. And at the sound of the trumpet, they break their jars. And so this echo would have come in the valley. And the men wake up in the middle of the night to come out. And what do they see coming towards them? Just lights. Fire. Like, what is going on? They panic. And God sends this panic to them when they start turning on each other and killing each other. Wow. And the 300 come in and they defeat God's enemies. Wow. Wow. And there was a strategy to it. They were organizing the groups. Yeah. You know, he says, number one, watch me. Follow my lead. Amen. Yeah. And they do exactly as he did. Well, I'm reminded of Jesus' church, and of course, we need a strategy to evangelize the world. Amen. Go to Mark chapter 3 if you will. Come on, right. 
We're going to fly through a few uh, passages here. Mark chapter 3. Come on, bro. We're going to introduce uh, what we're going to do to close out here. 3 and verse 13. It says, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called them those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach and have authority to drive out demons. This is the selection of the 12 apostles. And Jesus, guys, if he was just going to die for our sins, he could have just came, done that, and been done, and gone, amen, just go around preaching this to hundreds of people, right? And yet, he stayed on earth for 33 years, began his ministry at 30, and he focused on selecting a small group of men that he directed all of his attention to. So Jesus believed the church would be built through a small group. Yeah, Small groups are a principle of God. Now, in our congregation, we call those Bible talks. Amen? Amen. And the Bible talk emulates Jesus and the apostles, meaning you have a leader, oftentimes a co-leader, and then you have a group of disciples, right? And the purpose is that they might, in verse 14, be with Jesus, and that he might send them out to preach. So the purpose is that the group, they can watch Jesus. Look in John chapter 3. Come on. Come on, Mike. Come on, Mike. In John 3, and verse 22, you know, a lot of new Christians, they think Bible talk's just like for them, amen? amen? And they forget, actually, Bible talk is for non-Christians, amen? Yeah, amen. amen? That is for Christians, and I'll talk about that here in a moment from another perspective. But in John 3, verse 22, it says, After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside, where he spent some time with them and baptized. So what did Jesus do with his disciples? Baptized. Baptized. And he was the one doing it. Now look at chapter 4. Months later, in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his what? Disciples. Disciples. So Jesus' plan of discipleship was that the guys would walk with him and learn how to help others become disciples. And that's the goal of every Bible talk, is that they'll eventually split. Just like cells split, they divide and multiply. Amen? Right. That's the goal of every Bible talk in the church. You know, I was thinking about when our church grew the fastest the last few years. And you know what's interesting? Is our church grew the most fast when the COVID pandemic hit. Yeah. Now, I think obviously people are looking for God during that time. But what was interesting is that all of our Bible talks went to Zoom. And you know how that is. That's terrible, right? <laughs> so. But what we did for the Sunday service is that we were allowed by the city to have groups of more than 25 people meet in this square footage. Mm -hmm. And so we had five different services in New Hampshire and then all the regions, at the time they were sectors, we didn't call them regions because they were smaller, and meet here, and we had multiple services from like eight to four. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was crazy, so the quality of the service went down. Come on. Come on. You know, you didn't have <laughs> the band the experience every single time. Eventually we figured out some ways to make it a little better. But, but, Guys, people are getting baptized. Yeah. yeah. You say, what was the difference? Well, when you come to church in a room like this with like 20 people, you're kind of like, I probably should bring somebody. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you just kind of feel that added pressure. And then, like, you only have so many people who do communion every week. Yeah. You only have so many people who do the welcome every week. And you don't do the same thing every week. You know what I mean? Like, that gets monotonous, oh. right? And so everyone was involved. Come on, Mike. Our church prospers. Come on. Now, if you look at Acts chapter 2, Come on. Come on, Mike. in verse 26, Come on, bro. Come on. and I, I want to get us back to something that we need to restore biblically. In verse 46, it says, In the early church, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and made together with glad and sincere hearts. The early church met how often? Every day. Every day. Now, I don't personally think this means like every Christian had a meeting they had to go to every single day. Otherwise, like, you know, how would they like take care of themselves and that sort of thing, right? Yeah. But, but it's the idea that these 2,000 that were baptized, as God added to them, that every day there was some fellowship meeting throughout the city of Jerusalem. Good. Guys, church is not just this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The place where church really happens is in the temple courts and in the homes, if you will. Yeah. On our college campuses, at the Panera Breads, in your home. Are you with me right here? That's your church. Your Bible talk is to be your micro church. 
And that is the most important time of the week because oftentimes someone visiting won't come to a service like this, but they'll go, you know what, I'll get some food with you and have an informal discussion yeah. and play some games and stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's important to realize that this was how the early church operated. Um, for time, I'm going to cut this down a little bit. Let's go to just chapter 20, verse 20. There's a lot of verses in the book of Acts that show they met in homes. And in chapter 20, verse 20, uh, Paul comes and speaks to the church uh, in Ephesus. And notice what he says here. He's speaking, if you look at the context, to all the Ephesian elders. We call these like shepherds, right? Or pastors or church leaders in that yeah. sense. Paul never preached, and none of the early church leaders never preached to their entire congregation. Yeah. Say, what? Well, how could they? They didn't meet in auditorium and things like that. So Paul comes and he gets the elders, the church leaders together, and speaks to them, and the church leaders would have to bring back their messages to their groups. That's how the early church operated. Remember, the Jerusalem church, guys, was over 10,000. Antioch, they say, could have been 50,000. Wow. An average house at that time held 24 to 32 people. And so understand that they had to do Bible talk. They had to focus on small groups. And they have to depend on discipleship at a level where you and I don't understand. Yeah. But we've fallen into the mega church mentality. And certainly God wants a church that's mega. Amen. Yeah. But, but, but he wants every Christian to be involved in a small group so that they can be strengthened and taught and be sent out. So in chapter 20, verse 20, he says, you know that I've not hesitated to preach anything that would not be helpful to you, but I've taught you publicly and from house to house. Amen. Amen. Now, if you drop down in verse 31, he says, So be on your guard, remembering that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. So how often were they involved in each other's lives? Every day, Every day night and day, sometimes with tears. Amen? Are you close to your Bible talk family? Wow. Do you love them? They say, well, I just don't relate to anybody. Dude, it's time to be a friend and give. you got to serve, right? And for some of us who are still coming out the Zoom thing, well, I'd like to better when I just be at home and log on. Well, yeah, that's a lot more convenient, but I'm telling you, that would kill the church. Wow. There's just no point. Family is built when you're one-on-one -on -one together. Amen. You know, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19. Come on, Mike. Chapter 16, verse 19. The church in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord, and so does the church that meets at their what? Oh. House. House, amen. So they have house church there. Oh uh, Romans 16.5, Colossians 4.15. These are other ones that talk about the churches that met in homes. Mm -hmm. So I want to implore with you today that you've got your Bible talk that you're a part of. We need to reinvigorate those. And it's been awesome because we started talking about this at our staff meeting. Some of the Bible talks have been pretty pregnant. I so encourage you here at the Berkeley Bible Talk led by Josh. They had one for one visitors here. I'm encouraged to hear uh, one of the high school Bible Talks, a Bible Talk of one disciple. Wow! That's one, David. That's David. Bible talk of one disciple, you have a completely unified Bible talk. <laughs> and he went in there and he had seven visitors. Come on, David. <laughs> and, and I know these others have been stand out. I know some new Bible talks started. They had visitors. I mean, it's been very encouraging as we've gotten out of that Zoom thinking and we've gotten back to meeting together. And this was Jesus' plan to win the world. And so we need to understand that we've got to be a part of a Bible talk. And I would encourage you to take time to read the bulletin as it has different practicals to help your Bible talk be on fire for God. Amen? Amen. Let's close with our last scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Come on, Mike. Come on, bro. Come on, Mike. So we have a battle plan for the world, but you know something? You can't conquer the world until you conquer yourself. And Gideon had to conquer himself first. How do we do that? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Because of these surpassingly great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord, take it away from me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weakness. So that Christ's power may rest on me. 
That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. Wow. The Bible says there was a thorn in the flesh given to Paul. And many people have debated over the years what this is. The Bible actually just says it right there. It was a messenger of Satan. Now, we don't know exactly how he tormented him, whether it was a temptation for sin, whether it was insult or persecution, like he references there. But Paul goes, I plead with God, take it away! But then I came to a conviction, wow, God's grace is sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. And God actually wants me to boast about these struggles and these challenges, to be open about them, so that Christ's power can rest on me. For when I'm weak, then I am strong. And he learned to delight in hardship. You ever delight in hardship? You get a bill in the belly where it's collecting and you go, Amen! Amen! So I'm excited to see how God's going to work in this one. Oh, yeah! Love it. Go to the doctor, get a health challenge. Amen! Yes. Come on. It's part of my testimony. Come on! Yeah. Yeah. What if we could change our perception about hardships like Paul and start boasting about it? That's good. Wow. You know, we have good news sharing, and we like sharing about all the great accomplishments, but what if we started just boasting about our weaknesses and yeah. what God did through those? Yeah. Yeah. Now, again, boasting about your weaknesses is not like, I realize so hard this week. I've got my life, and, uh, you know, pray for me. Help us out. No, God's grace came in, and the word grace here is the idea of empowerment to overcome wow. Amen. And so this is awesome. This gives us a battle plan. Number one, you've got to be open. Yeah. Got to be transparent about the struggles you're having. It doesn't have to be sin you'd be open with. Yeah. Uh, most about weaknesses and hardships. Get brothers and sisters around you. Secondly, you got to fully commit yourself to God as we talked about. Mm-hmm. That's just a decision. There's no practical. I can't tell you. Do you know? Yeah. Mix this with flour and sugar and, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> just got to be a decision. You, gotta, you can make that today. Oh, it doesn't matter how you feel. You can make a decision to go to the gym, right? Yeah. Right. You make a decision to fully commit to God. Amen. Number three, you got to be loyal to your Bible talk. Yes. This worked because they go, we're going to follow Gideon. Now, is Gideon perfect? No. No, I mean, in fact, he takes it later. He should have continued to lead the people. He's like, I don't want to lead. You guys can do whatever you want. I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> that, that wasn't good. Wow. So your Bible talk leader is not Jesus. Yeah. But you need to imitate the Christ-like things in And be loyal, amen? Amen. So my challenge, guys, today... Is let's go after winning the world for Christ. We've got a God sized battle, yes. but we've got a God that can be bigger than any challenge that may come in our lives. And I pray that today we can go from weakness to strength. And the God Amen. 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 Amen.